Realizing he can't deal with the peculiar plant at the moment, Dion decides to revisit the issue after the hunting competition. Stepping out of the carriage, he contemplates the dual challenges posed by the unpredictable plant and the upcoming hunting event. In the midst of this tension, Dion, feeling a twinge of fear, notices Dan's hand nearing him. Dan questions Dion if something is amiss, causing Dame Lion to express her displeasure at Dan's behavior towards Dion. She predicts that Dion might not easily forgive Dan for his actions. However, much to everyone's surprise, instead of lashing out at Dan, Dion acknowledges his quick understanding and expresses gratitude, revealing that he wasn't feeling well earlier. This unexpected response from Dion earns him cheers from the crowd, who not only appreciate his forgiveness, but also admire his ability to rise above the situation without confrontation. Experiencing a sigh of relief, Dion reflects on the close call, realizing how accustomed he has become to the unique treatment in the demonic realm. Aware that confronting Dan now might complicate matters, he decides to let it go and plans to address the issue with Dan later. As Dion continues, he encounters Lion, who inquires about his well-being. While engaged in conversation, a helpful subordinate notices Dion holding a bag and attempts to assist, but Dion swiftly declines, cautioning the subordinate not to touch the bag. Shifting the topic, Dion asks Lion about the whereabouts of the others. However, before Lion can respond, Prince Eduardo arrives and informs Dion that he had summoned him earlier. Respecting Eduardo, Dion greets him, and Eduardo brings up the topic of hunting monsters during the upcoming competition. Dion acknowledges hearing about it, understanding the official pretext. Simultaneously, he's aware that the real purpose is to showcase the Empire's perceived freedom even in the midst of war. Eduardo furthermore mentions that since they have so many monsters, so in order to prevent any accidents, they are going to get rid of all the monsters on the hunting ground right now and leave a few for the hunting competition. Moreover, Eduardo asks for the murderous Gono and the lofty knights to assist him with this task. Dion shows reluctance with helping Eduardo out with his task, however he gives control of the lofty knights to Eduardo. And while Dion is thinking about how Eduardo is going to handle the knights, Eduardo mentions to Dion that he will be the one leading them, leaving him surprised. In order to get out of this, Dion starts thinking of ways to not control the knights and moreover decides to execute his plan of getting injured and going home. Soon, a wolf pack arrives from the jungle and charge towards Dion which makes him excited. However, to his amazement, Lion jumps in front of Dion and slays down every single one of the wolf from the wolf pack. Unable to help himself, Dion mentions to Lion that she is good at protecting him. Thereupon, Lion mentions to Dion that she will ensure that he does not have to participate in the battle this time and protect him to the best of her ability. Along the way, Dion's men manage to wipe off all the monsters and wolves along the way and Dion believes that at this rate he is going to have to participate in the hunting competition. Dion wonders if he should fall from his horse and injure himself. Suddenly, the horse gets disbalanced making Dion shake, a bit which results in his bag strap getting torn off. Dan approaches Dion and mentions that it is because of him that the horse shook a bit and moreover apologizes for it, and Dion accepts it. Dion then checks to see if the flower died, however nothing happens. Soon, Dan approaches Dion from behind and asks him as to why he never gets angry. Dion inquires to Dan as to what he said and Dan replies that he has been making a lot of mistakes tonight, yet not even once Dion has gotten mad at him. Dan actually started following Dion Hart because he is the disaster. Dan expected rage befitting that title, but Dion has been only kind and considerate towards Dan so far. Dan thinks to himself as to what if Dion Hart isn't the disaster. Meanwhile, Dion thinks that Dan wants him to get angry, however suddenly a group of monsters start coming their way and so Dion immediately starts leaving while mentioning to Dan that they will talk after the hunt. Dion is hell-bent on getting injured by this group of monsters so that he can have an excuse to head home and he chooses a monster capable of hurting Dion by only a little however Lion arrives and saves Dion from the monster again. 
Dion chooses another monster and gets excited that it is going to be his ticket back home. However, two of his subordinates manage to kill off that monster as well, leaving Dion furious. Dion expresses his irritation as to why his men are so working so hard and thereupon, Dion sees a monster getting the better of one of his subordinates, and in another attempt to head back home after getting injured, Dion charges towards the monster with an indomitable stance. Seeing Dion in such motivation, his subordinates gets a bit scared as to why he is using such a high-level skill on a stupid monster hunt, and soon as Dion is about to reach the monster, his subordinates start running his way to stop him, and in an attempt of doing that, they jump on him. Furious, now that the monster has run away, Dion asks his men as to why they did it, and one of the men mentions that it is because Dion was going to use the dangerous skill. Dion's men actually means the skill which momentarily allows one to exceed their maximum speed and upper body strength, and it results in them being the strongest and fastest human. However, its side effect include vicious damages to their muscles and bones after the battle. Dion, in a fit of anger, frees himself from the grasp of his men and asks them to let him go. Soon, one a man arrives and mentions that they should head back to the competition grounds since the subjugation is over, leaving Dion disappointed since he didn't manage to get injured by any of the monsters. Thereupon, Dion expresses his desire to kill monsters, and so his men mentions to him that they have to love monsters for the competition and asks Dion to kill as many monsters as he would like during the competition. Later, while being in bed, Eduardo asks Dion if he really has to participate in the hunting competition, and Dion immediately realizes that since Eduardo brought up the hunting competition, then he must have something to say to him regarding the war, especially since this war is against the demonic realm. The next morning, the insane plant peeks out of the bag again and starts screaming leading Dion to put it back to its place when suddenly one of his men, Kletter, arrives there. Thereupon, Kletter asks Dion to take another aid with him in the competition, and moreover explains that Dan is being extremely suspicious of something and moreover mentions that he doesn't trust him. In response, Dion asks Lion to take Kletter away and Lion arrives in no time to grab Kletter by his ear to take him away, however Kletter doesn't stop with his idea for Dion to carry another aid with him. Actually, Dion is also aware that Dan is being suspicious, however due to the insane plant, he cannot really take many people with him. Thereafter, Lion also agrees with Kletter's idea, and moreover both of them asks Dion to take them with him, however Dion is swift in declining both of their requests and doesn't even bother giving them a reason for doing so. Dion then starts heading out, while Lion and Kletter chase him to convince him to take them with him, when soon a noble man arrives and mentions as to why they are treating a real count and an honorary count with the same courtesy. Meanwhile, Dion is wondering as to who this man is. The crowd start contemplating as to who this nobleman is, however they think of him as stupid, since he is insulting Dion Hart. Dion asks the nobleman as to who he is, and in response the nobleman mentions that he is the true patriarch of the Hart family, the true Count Hart and moreover mentions to Dion that he is not a fake like him. Meanwhile, the other could not believe what he was saying since they thought that the Harts have been annihilated. Dion realizes that since the collateral line exists, the Hart family may still exist somewhere, and he did hear that Cruel rejected the offer to become the Count, and so Dion believes that some random collateral descendant ended up becoming the patriarch of the family. With a grim smile on his face, Dion approaches the real Count Hart and congratulates him while wishing him to do his best. Dion is excited since he cannot wait to perish the Hart family and moreover, he believes that some greedy members from the family appointed an idiot to be their pawn in the Count's position. Shortly after, Eduardo arrives and shows his gratitude for everyone's presence and asks for the competition to begin as soon as they are ready. There is a custom in the Empire where the lovers hand out ribbons to the warriors leaving on their journey and for friends and family to provide them with handkerchiefs. Meanwhile, Lion is standing while reflecting upon his past where she used to hand over handkerchiefs to her brother eight years ago during the war. 
Dion inquires to Lion if her brother had enlisted to go to the war instead, and in response Lion mentions that her parents prohibited her from volunteering. Lion moreover mentions that since she is much more skilled with the sword and in better health, it was sickening and extremely anxious for her to see her sick brother head off to war. And so, Lion became a knight so that her parents won't be able to say no to that. This seems very commendable to Dion, and he finds the story to be very similar to a tale that he knows, although the ending is completely different. Meanwhile, Cruel Heart is eagerly waiting with full preparation to execute his plan of killing Dion. Turns out, last night at the Hart family manor, Duke Illister Starb asked Cruel Heart to kill off Dion Hart while mentioning that he will arrange archers and assassins for the hunting competition. Thereupon, Cruel inquires to Illuster if he knows where Dion will be, and in response, Illuster mentions that Dion doesn't like crowded places, so if they were to lure him to monster tracks, they would be able to kill him. On the other hand, Dion knows nothing about Illuster, and unbeknownst to him, he would participate in the hunting competition. Meanwhile, at the competition, the real Count Hart inquires to Dion as to why he is going without horses, and in response Dion tells him that it is harder for horses to enter this area. Shortly after, Dion makes his way to a deserted area and decide to pretend to kill a few monsters and meanwhile, he will get rid of the insane plant when suddenly a bunch of arrows come flying to Dion's way, however Dan manages to push Dion away. Soon, the assassins come out of the bushes and start attacking Dion and Dan, and a fearsome battle takes place. Soon, Dion starts regretting for not listening to Kletter when he asked for him to take more guards with him. Dion is frustrated as to why he has to work so hard. The real Count Hart is a coward as he is hiding behind a tree, Dan has just started learning swordsmanship, and Dion himself doesn't have enough strength or the talent to take care of all the assassins. The battle proceeds and Dion manages to fight efficiently, however the tables turn and now Dion has been cornered when suddenly a huge number of arrows come flying towards Dion once again and Dion is worried while thinking as to how to do dodge them. The fierce look on Dion's face turns into hope when he sees Dan coming his way and soon as all the arrows hit, a huge smoke cloud appears and perishes and thereupon Dion notices cruel heart. As Cruel proceeds to attack Dion with his hand, he catches Cruel's hand in mid-air and questions to him if he thought that he won't be recognized just because he is wearing a robe. Moreover, Dion inquires to Cruel as to what he is plotting when suddenly something unexpected happens and the insane plant grows extremely tall and start attacking the assassins, leaving Dion surprised. The plant turns out to be extremely powerful as the assassins start backing off while trembling off in fear after facing such a powerful creature. The plant manages to take care of all the assassins, and while Dion should be relieved that the assassins has been taken care of, he somehow feels like he is in more danger now. Soon, the knights arrive there and notices the monster and thereupon, the real Count Hart mentions to the knights that the monster plant came out of Dion's bag and moreover mentions that he is the one controlling it. Meanwhile, Dion realizes that Cruel has run away already and the situation seems to be getting worse for Dion and so Dion believes that he now has to take care of the stupid plant first and moreover wonders if he should kill it for real this time. Determined to finally finish it off. Dion approaches the plant while flashing his blade towards it when suddenly the plant counterattacks and ties Dion using its vines as Dion falls on the ground injured. The knights now realize that the plant is not actually on Dion's side so they decide to help Dion out. Meanwhile, Dion is being tightly gripped by the formidable plant monster, however he manages to cut off the plant's vine to free himself from its grasp and manages to defeat it at the same time. The atmosphere filled with intents now becomes astonishing as the knights stand in shock to see Dion defeating such a powerful monster all by himself and with just one hit. Dan swiftly runs to Dion to see if he is alright and notices that he has bled a lot. 
Meanwhile, Dion could not believe it either that he was able to defeat the plant with just one hit and wonders if he is okay when suddenly he coughs out some blood, however he doesn't suffer any major injuries, and although it might have seemed like Dion was violently attacked, but before he hit the ground, the plant actually protected Dion's head with its vines. Moreover, when Dion was wielding his weapon around out of pure instinct, the plant happened to place its vital point directly on the blade and killed itself. Dion believes that the plant realized that he would be in trouble if they were to appear on the same side and attack Dion to show that they weren't in cahoots. Meanwhile, Dan is reflecting on how the real Count Hart mentioned about the plant monster coming out of Dion's bag and Dan saw it too and believes it to be a suspicious situation no matter what, and Dan also realizes that the monster plant attacking the Lord and killing itself helped them get rid of the suspicions. While taking him back, Dan gets asked by Dion if he is satisfied now and Dan responds while mentioning that he is. Actually, as soon as Dan saw the monster coming out of Dion's bag, he stopped assisting and simply just watched the event unfold, and he then became certain that Dion Hart is indeed the disaster. Dan decides to never doubt Dion again. Back at their camp, Dion inquires as to what is up with the real Count Hart and Clutter reveals that he escaped as soon as Dion was ambushed to save his own skin. Soon, Dion approaches Count Hart and asks him if he is staying at the real Hart estate right now. Dion then proceeds to indirectly threaten Count Hart and asks him to stop acting if he does not want to feel his wrath. Soon, it gets announced that the Emperor is making his entrance. The Emperor asks everyone if they enjoyed the hunting competition under the care of the Crown Prince. The Emperor then proceeds to announce the winners and Cruel Heart manages to secure third spot, Elpidius Desera as second spot and Dion secures the first place. Edward mentions that since it is the first time that someone has discovered a monster plant, that's why he awarded Dion extra points. Edward then mentions that he would like to announce something before everyone moved to the banquet. Edward then announces that from this day onwards, they will stop all wars within the demonic realm and will wage war on the demonic realm. Eduardo promises to put an end to all conflicts within the human realm and to fight the demonic realm. Furthermore, Eduardo reveals that the demon king has declared that they would take part in the warfare against the human realm. Meanwhile, Dion Hart finds out somewhat odd, and did he not account for the fact that some humans may try to support the demons? The Demon King simply accepted him, an ordinary human, and even appointed him as the Zero Corps commander. He further accuses as to why the Emperor does not consider such a simple factor. Later, in any case, Eduardo reports that because Dion Hart went through a huge ordeal at a royal palace-hosted event, he will be reimbursed for his efforts in addition to the first-place reward, which will be given to his home. Dion Hart deliberately thanks him. Eduardo further alleges he summoned his privately to address a different matter. Suddenly, Dion zones out, which leads Eduardo to scold him. Eduardo urges him to take part in this war as well. This makes Dion to zone out again. Eduardo believes that it's about time he makes a decision who he will side with. Dion believes he has provided him with numerous of opportunities so far as he has been out on a monster subjugation mission returned with the corpse of the hero. It is an incredible feat, but thanks to that, he is now an absolute mess. In the past, Dion asks the spy if he has found a way to get rid of the seal. The spy proclaims he would have returned to the demonic realm. He could not imagine the turns of events that would take place when he sent him back to the demonic realm at the time. Dion inquires whether the information he has brought back on the core commanders will be of great help to the Empire. The spy apologies and mentions that he has not yet found a way to undo the curse. After a while, Dion wonders what the Demon King could benefit from such an intel that was brought back from the demonic realm, which is detailed enough, and it could only be obtained by those who are closest to the Demon King. Moreover, rumors about the Zero Core Commander starts to circulate when Dion keeps going back and forth the demonic realm. Dion gets furious by the fact that he is not only working for the Empire, but the Demon King is also using him. 
he is remaining perfectly neutral between the humans and demonic realms as he continues to work as a double agent. Back to present Eduardo establishes that Dion is not on his side, but he's not on their side either. Eduardo is aware that Dion will not disclose any information unless he is questioned about it. Eduardo is also aware that Dion may not make any moves voluntarily, but he follows every order. As long as one possesses him, Dion will become the most useful piece. That's how the game starts between the Demon King and Eduardo with unspoken rules. The participants are the Demon King and the Eduardo and the host is Dion as well as the reward. Eduardo furthermore ventures whatever curse it is, he's sure it will be broken once they slay the Demon King. He affirms that he is a human. Meanwhile, Alethea Dessert thinks she should have given the Count her ribbon prior before he left for the hunting competition. Soon, Dion arrives there and greets Alethea. She reveals that she heard something happen during the hunting competition and thereupon Dion proposes to take his conversation somewhere quiet. Alethea agrees and they proceed to move out. Outside, Alethea asks Dion if he is feeling all right and in response Dion mentions that he is still feeling a bit upset. Dion mentions that he thought that Alethea would forget about him since she does not actually like him, while emphasizing on the latter part. Alethea realizes that Dion is mocking her and that he knows that she has been putting on an act, so she mentions to Dion that he is right. However, Dion, with a heavy heart, asks Alethea to not waste any more time on him since he has utterly failed and soon he leaves. Bewildered, Alethea wonders if he does not want to marry and rather have a peculiar preference. Meanwhile, Dion is feeling like he has been wrongly accused of something when suddenly, Marquis Stigma puts his hand on Dion's shoulder and asks as to where has been while referring to him as Junior. Dion is bewildered by his sudden arrival, wondering how he ended up talking to Marquis Stigma as he was conversing with the Emperor just a while ago. With concern evident on Dion's face, Stigma can't help but question what has happened to him and whether his arrival disturbed Dion. Despite contemplating how the Emperor left him in the middle of the chat, Dion remembers nothing. He saves thoughts about the Emperor for later and focuses on handling the challenge standing before him. He questions Stigma if he has some business with him, and Stigma responds sarcastically that he had been missing his junior. Stigma dons a fake smile and shows if he is pretty pleased to run into Dion. This is when the butler questions what Stigma means by deeming Dion as junior. Shocked by the butler's choice of words, Stigma wonders when he acquainted Dion since it's his first time having a talk with the boy in focus. He further adds that the reason for deeming him as Junior is only because he carries a liking for Dion. Nodding his head, the butler then utters that they must ask the Count to act as a judge for them. On the flip side, Dion does not have the slightest idea about what they are talking about. The man introduces himself as amiable, conveys his pleasure in making his acquaintance, and goes on to add that he has heard a lot about Dion and his accomplishments. While they are having a nice little interaction, Stigma puts his nose into the matter and introduces himself to the two. Dion questions on what matter does Stigma require him to act as a judge, and Stigma swiftly responds that it's nothing but a mere disagreement with Margrave. He sarcastically adds that their arguments are pretty plain and it won't take him long to decide who is on the right side. Stigma explains that the barbarians from the Barbari tribe, which live in the southernmost region of the empire, have been continuously encroaching on his area, invading his estate, stealing food and killing innocents. Owing to the intricacies posed by the Barbari tribe, Stigma decided to inform the emperor. Although he does not expect any reinforcements from the Emperor before the war against the Daimonic Realm, he wants to personally wipe them off from the estate. However, his right hand, Mr. Mincha Margrave, has objected to the decision. Deep down, Dion is worried that they are pretty keen to see the Emperor too. However, the Emperor has asked to handle the matter on their own. Hearing their argument, Dion assesses that they want his judgment on whether they should wipe the barbarians first or convince them to fight by their side in the war against the Daimonic Realm. Dion begins to express his understanding of the matter. 
He believes Margrave is certain that the barbarians will not side with the demons. Margrave adds that barbarians are human like them, and they won't side with demons even if they bear resentment against the emperor. That is right, you are smart, shouts Stigma when he finds Dion questioning Margrave regarding his assertions. He puts his hand on the soft-hearted Margrave's shoulder, telling him that the only things that move the human instinct in a fight are hatred and strength. Dion thinks that if the demons are incredibly powerful, humans will side with them to spare their lives. They may even be willing to sell their souls to demons to kill those whom they hate. Stigma adds that there is a higher possibility that barbarians will side with the demons. He is pleased that Dion took his side, donning a smile of victory over his face. He asks Margrave to take his leave since Stigma himself will take this matter further to the Emperor. When Margrave questions their plans, Stigma maintains that he desires to stay a little longer with his junior. Although Dion wanted to leave immediately since everyone is staring at him, this man in front of him is not letting him do so. Finding Dion acting awkwardly to the eyes sticking at him, Stigma asserts that Dion does not like to be noticed and Dion can only hear him quietly. Dion changes the topic and mentions that he barely noticed Stigma's brown eyes, infuriated by the comment. He maintains that he knows his eyes are pretty common and cheap, much like his mother. This is when Dion realizes that he has made a grave mistake. He had almost forgotten that Stigma was a bastard and his mother was a mere commoner. When he fears that Stigma is infuriated, he may hit someone with the bottle of wine, Stigma proves his fears wrong. He turns to Dion with a smile on his face, hinting that the wine will suit their long conversation better. When Stigma pours a drink for Dion, he clearly hesitates because it has been a while since his last drink. This is when Stigma breaks into a huge laughter, deeming Dion as naive. Stigma maintains that he now understands why the Emperor treasures Dion so much. When Dion attempts to deny, Stigma maintains that it is pretty evident that the Emperor likes talents, especially those who are like himself. Someone who started at the bottom and made the way from to the top, someone who fails to acknowledge himself and has the obsession of proving himself, and lastly, the one who murders his own family. Dion clearly denies knowing anything about what Stigma is referring to. However, Stigma knowingly further probes him. His revelations cross a flashback from his past before Dion's eyes when he insisted on his father. Seeing him tremble with the revelations, Stigma turns his focus to the drinks, offering him to enjoy the one he specifically brought from the south. On the flip side, the emperor prepares for the banquet when he is visited by Duke Illuster. The duke enters the room where the emperor is preparing himself and questions if the emperor hallucinates. The emperor deems his question rubbish. The emperor gave him precious minutes of his time, yet he did not expect the duke to utter such nonsense. However, the duke appears persistent that the emperor hallucinates and he has reasons for his assertions. The emperor appears to be the most prominent figure of the empire. His left hand does not heal despite carrying the fragment of a warrior. Moreover, his habit of staring into space further solidifies the claim. Despite his importance, the Emperor finds solace in looking into his past. It's unfortunate for the Duke that their Emperor is often affected by his smallest mistakes and often succumbs to them so easily. The Emperor, troubled by his words, asks the Duke to explain himself. The Duke puts up a shocking proposal before the Emperor to leave the position that is burdening him and pass it to someone else. The Emperor smirks back and sarcastically offers Duke to take it by beheading the Emperor. The cunning Duke maintains that he does not desire the crown for himself since he does not possess the qualification. But he is rather referring to Kruer, who is the leader of the nobles and has a hero of the Empire as his subordinate. Duke believes that Kruer carries a strong influence over the people because of the church redemption incidents. That is not it. He further adds that Kruer has pretty fine ties with the Revolutionary Army. He controls the boundaries of relations between nobles and citizens as well. The Emperor questions the Duke about the reason for this proposal, however, he rightly understands that Duke carries no grounds to dethrone him. He rather provokes and pressurizes the Emperor to dethrone himself. 
Unconvinced by the deliberation, the emperor asks for a suitable reason for the proposal. This is when the cunning duke comes to the point, he maintains that he desires absolute power in certain matters and only the position of emperor can bring such absolute authority. Unbothered by the deliberation, the emperor firmly conveys that he does not consider leaving the crown merely for a few words from the duke. The duke smirks at the emperor and takes his leave. On his way back, the duke assesses that the emperor bears no sense of crisis over the war. Moreover, had he been better in the affairs, the emperor could have used duke's words against him. He is certain that the emperor must take into account all the possibilities, be it the nobles joining demons or the other nations joining demons to crush them. Deeming the emperor naive, the duke orders his people to reach Shiland to spread rumors about demons. The duke wants to keep a fair distance and fear of mistrust between humans and demons. He appears ready to drag the emperor into another war. To the duke, this emperor is his entire belonging. He does not want to lose it. In the banquet, chaos caused by their clinching swords and bottles falling on the floor impels others to hurry out. Stigma proposes to Dion that he should consider giving up, or else this entire banquet will be turned into ruins. But Dion does not want to leave it in the middle. He questions why Stigma referred to himself as an enemy at the first place. However, Stigma attempts to clarify that he was testing him. Unfazed by his explanations, Dion comes charged at him to get the better of Stigma. Moments earlier, when Dion was apparently quite drunk, Dion questioned if Stigma is his enemy, and Stigma affirmed his doubts. Now at present, Stigma maintains that had he known Dion's response, he would have never lied to him. Dion has assessed the possibilities before taking on Stigma. He understands that Stigma does not possess the fragment of a warrior. This means taking on him could be a little easier for him. However, contrary to his expectations, Stigma demonstrates formidable speed and agility. Infuriated by his relentless attacks, Stigma now wants to go all out on Dion. But just when he puts everything into the attack at Dion, he is interrupted in the middle by a sudden arrival of Kruer. However, Kruer is not the only one to arrive. The Emperor also makes his way inside conveying his disappointment at them both. Dion on the other hand has lost his sanity, he smashes the elder brother on the floor, deeming him as the enemy instead of Stigma. Dion shocks the Emperor as he shifts his weight and dislocates his arm. Enraged at Dion for not obeying his command to cease the attack, the Emperor slams his head onto the floor. Branding him an insolent bastard, the Emperor realizes that Dion has dislocated a part, understanding the impending danger of a potential fatal injury if left unchecked. Despite multiple efforts from his brother and the Emperor himself, Dion insists that Stigma is an enemy who must face death. Employing his skills, the Emperor manages to subdue Dion's anger and restore some semblance of sanity. Once Dion appears to be in better shape, the Emperor questions the full restoration of his senses, informing him that the wrist has been relocated, but further medical attention is necessary. Reflecting on the incident during his departure, Kruer acknowledges his mistake in provoking and reacting impulsively. However, he can't ignore the fact that Stigma posed a threat to his younger brother, whom he deeply cares for due to their brotherly bond. Turning to Senjur, he entrusts him with the task of staying by Dion's side and delivering a crucial message upon his awakening a directive to return home immediately. When Dion wakes up, he begins questioning the surroundings. He asks himself about the aches all over his body and the presence of the royal physician beside him. The physician tells him that the emperor has relocated his wrist back, and there is not much to be concerned about, besides that he will have to refrain from using his wrist much for the coming few days. The revelation flips Dion on his head. He contemplates when all this happened to him and where he hurt himself. The emperor then turns to Stigma and reprimands him for using strong alcohol in the banquet. The Emperor calls them weaklings who tend to rely on drugs and drinks to sustain themselves. Senjur, still beside Dion, holds his hand conveying his pleasure that Dion has finally woken up. Dion raises from the bed and apologizes to the Emperor and Stigma for causing chaos in the banquet. 
the mood is lightened when Dion addresses Stigma as a senior and questions if he was not much of a burden while he was drunk, and Stigma swiftly responds that it was totally fine. When he recalls the words from the Emperor, Dion realizes that he was not only under the influence of drinks, but rather the hallucinations from the past. It was pretty similar to post-war traumatic stress disorder, where everyone appears like an enemy to the person. This sparks questions in Stigma's head too. He wonders if Dion has been in the war at the mere age of 14. And are those rumors about his participation in the war true? If these rumors are true, they clearly reflect that Dion is even more phenomenal than his thoughts about him. As soon as Dion begins to get up, blood plunders from his nostrils, hinting at a possible nervous damage. Although the doctor has rushed to help Dion, he does not have the slightest idea of what is happening to Dion at first. The Emperor fears that this could be the curse of the Demon King, as the curse weakens the body and he asks the physician to leave. Stigma is intrigued by the Emperor's words. He thinks that Dion has worked pretty hard not to appear weak. He begins to develop a liking for the Junior with every revelation. On his return to the mansion, Kruer finds the Duke waiting for him at the chess table. Before he can question anything, the Duke orders him to kneel, and when Kruer asks for deliberation, the assassins behind the Duke stab a dagger in his thigh, impelling him to kneel. Kruer is quick enough to analyze that the Duke has come over with assassins rather than his usual guards. Without any time to argue over things, the Duke gets straight to the point and questions what made Kruer think that Duke will not find him out protecting Dion.